also a, like a anchor like a t- yeah I do a lot of presenting yeah I just I just did the which is amazing actually I did the um I emceed the masterclass for makeup by Mario you know uh, mm-hmm. Kim Kardashian so I did it yesterday in La Pearl and uh first of all he's amazing like he's so talented but uh it was actually just really nice because like it was filled with like makeup artists and of course like you know top spenders of Sephora and stuff but what I really wanted to get across to that crowd was that like you know even if you're like a blogger and you put your name on something Mm -hmm. you might have this peak of sales but you'll drop right if you're not like putting energy into like product development and learning and like and I thought like yesterday I just really enjoyed interviewing him because he is a true perfectionist. Like, Mm. you know, I went for sound check at three or something. I ended up staying because just to watch him give the, almost like giving the best performance, right? He's giving this masterclass, but like he made sure there were monitors on every side. Mm. The lighting was perfect. Like it wasn't about him getting paid. He was like, I'm going to give them the best experience. And of course he has this incredible journey where he started at Sephora and then fast forward, you know, he ends up, um, you know, his talent gets spotted and he he ends up taking this you know kim kardashian's like a call Mm -hmm. through a friend he didn't even you know he didn't even like a friend was like he was a photographer and he's like i need a makeup artist can you just come it's a girl named kim kardashian you know he has this great story but what i wanted to get across to those 300 people in la pearl like was that it takes hard work and when you have clients like just like you have your own business right like if you're not maintaining those relationships and being so professional with those big clients that you have Mm -hmm they're not going to come back to you. Yes. It might be like, oh, Hikmet was great, but I'll just try someone else. Mm-hmm. If you, It takes a lot of professionalism and hard work and ethics and values of like, you know, your standard of business, what you're delivering to the client. And that's what I loved about the interview with him yesterday. You know, and mm-hmm. that's what I love. You know, it's exciting. With like, I know we're going to talk about my business, but like about fashion and stuff. But like, I feel like I've been in it for 25 years. Like what I'm excited about now is like my journey. I'm in my forties. I'm doing things that I love. I'm, I get to share stories. Um, I get to do like the philanthropic stuff that I'm excited about now. You know, I feel like sometimes when you pay your dues and you build your name, you build your business. But, um, yeah, I just think as women as well, like you get caught up with all these responsibilities and sometimes it's nice to just kind of pause and be like, okay, what am I really passionate about mm-hmm. now, you know? Mm-hmm. And uh, the good thing is like, uh, it's, what's hard is like, you, you have to always plant these values everywhere yeah. and they don't grow or they grow, but they take time until you see them. Ooh. So it's something and that you, you need to plant the seeds. Yes. 100%. And it takes time, time, but that's the only way, you know, it's just like my clients are clients who, who I know since many years yeah. and they have all the, always remember the the good thing that you did for them yeah and they come back and and that's how uh, the accumulation has uh, uh, well it's so funny because I remember the first time I shot with you was for um oh sorry <laughs> I was like we're chatting yeah but I mean uh, if you don't mind we can put no, this of course. Yeah? yeah yeah no I was just saying I remember the first time I shot with you was for Shiseido like for a product it was years ago and it was like a women's empowerment group of women which is amazing but even now like when your office calls me or when you call me the the fact that in in I know in the Middle East the minute you say Hikmet it's like the photographer right like you ha- you want to work with you you make sure that I'm gonna look the best like I trust you I know that you're gonna make me look the best and feel the best and be confident in front of the camera and even now I feel like I, I hope that when people hear Roseman they're gonna be like okay she works hard she over delivers she's you know, she has a value system in place. And even when my media deck goes around, it just says Roseman, but mm. I really have a brand value system in place. And so as much as brands will come up to me and it's it's not about the money, it's really about how am I gonna have longevity with my brand of Roseman? So anything that I'm associated with, and I have a very defined brand value system. And so, you know, when my deck goes out, I am very proud of what I built over the past 20 years. And also what I believe in as well, because I feel like now people genuinely see, um, you know, authenticity, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, I hope so. I hope that th- these values and this hard work can can be the, the the column, the main thing that we can depend on, because that's what makes the difference between a hard worker, a passionate person uh, who is, um, you know, building his brand or building his talent and, and uh, getting the education, putting the hard work. And uh, b- but unfortunately, some, you know, some uh, maybe the maybe the social media, maybe the, the it's giving opportunities 
I don't know how they can maintain, but some people are, are getting this as an opportunity, which is fast going, uh, growing fast and having that big, which is great. I'm, I'm not, yeah. I'm not saying it's something bad, but maybe for people who didn't jump into that fast exposure that can happen from social media the, and they might be very, very good people, very hardworking people, and they can't benefit because it's uh, just a different uh, al algorithm, it's a different trend, it's a different way to, to expose yourself. How do you see that difference? How, how do you see, like, do you, uh, do you value uh, the fact that maybe um, people can, can be famous, can have a big business from just being trendy? From being trendy? <laughs> I, I know you said yeah. I heard I, I hate the word influencer. I mean, yeah, I don't think I mean, influencer, I think it's just overly, overly used. And I think everyone influences their circle, right? Like your circle of friends. So um, I think to be successful using social media, I think it takes brands to really look at who do you want representing your brand, right? Social media is here. It's here to stay. And I try and look at the benefits of it. So for me, what originally I'd be probably sending my demo reel around when I was presenting, a lot of times clients will just jump on my Instagram and be like, oh, okay, she presented at this or she hosted this last night or she was on stage you know, at this event. It's almost like a CV, right? But I'm very uh, careful about my Instagram. So it's probably not curated perfectly, but I know how much of my personal life I want to tap into it, so I don't really have too much of my personal life. It is a lot of, it's a little bit of work, it's maybe a few friends. Uh, I try and give my followers a glimpse of my life, um, but I am quite, you know, private, and I, I like that. I, I like being able to shut off my phone and have dinner with my friends and enjoy it and not take pictures of every dish that comes, right? It, but you kind of go through phases. So for me, I try and be as careful as I can. And, and for people that are using social media to their benefit, that's amazing, right? Like it's just a new platform to, um, to be on. But I think when it comes to branding and brand collaborations, mm -hmm. I think it really goes down to the brand executives to say, it's not really about the numbers. It should be, you know, does that person represent the product that I want? to reach out to the group of the group of people that they have right so it doesn't matter if someone has a thousand followers or one million followers it really has to be about the quality and, and what brand value system does that person represent yeah the reason why i, I brought this subject is is not about the the, oh, the social media by itself it's an amazing uh, platform it's an amazing uh, a way to to show the brand and to uh, advertise for it but it's just that that the trending when i when i said trending also that the fact that something can go viral sometimes yeah. with with one second yeah and the brands are sometimes get caught with that and then they want to try to 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 copy these trends or to copy this uh, uh dynamic that's happening in the in the content by itself and then sometimes they i i feel like okay is this your guideline are you losing anything of your a brand image and and values but then maybe they are in a transition period at that time where they have to experience it's a that. quick change you can just imagine right like digital age happened very quickly mm -hmm. right pretty much overnight where you know i was contributing with harper's bazaar for 13 years and i still work with them and so i saw it right in the front line you know having a publication and really having to digitize the you know the pages the stories the content and it's a lot of work because you have to be really quick and so i saw it right front and center working for an incredible publication and, and the importance of being digital and making sure that information goes out and be, trying to be the first you know to share it with your readers and followers but um i think a lot of it is a learning curve for everyone you know it, there's no precedent to this mm -hmm. so everyone's figuring it out I, I must admit i was one of the last ones i feel to get on instagram like mm -hmm. i feel like i only got on it very late because you know I signed a contract with a brand and I was leaving to Paris and they were like what's your Instagram handle <laughs> and I remember just sitting in the airport with one of my colleagues and I was like okay Roseman's world and I didn't even think about it right yeah. um but the people that you're right the people that signed on right at the beginning and jumped on that opportunity there was no algorithm so hmm. I'm sure their followers are um you know in the Massive. millions um 
but yeah, I think it's a learning yeah. curve for everyone. Uh, Rosemary, we jump quickly without yes. uh, introducing you. I just want to, <laughs> I love that. I love to just start the, the, the talk, but tell me about your journey, how you started. Um, you were born in Canada and uh, you, you started from the little things you were inspired by your sister yeah. when you sh sh uh, saw her in uh, high heels uh, <laughs> and uh, you start to love fashion, love your Barbie, start to tailor or buy, <laughs> buy clothes for your Barbie and then the love of fashion started and, and then you, uh, you jump into education and you had so many opportunities yeah. and I don't want to run them quickly. Yeah. Maybe you can talk me through that. So I, my parents, people always ask me where I'm from. So I am Indian by origin. My parents were born in East Africa and they left East Africa with the whole Idi Amin situation. So they had to leave the country. Uh, my dad had set up a business and had studied in the UK. And my dad's family was quite big and my sister was already born. So she was already three when all of this happened in 72. As a family, they decided to relocate to Canada. And you can just imagine like, you know, only now, cause I'm in my for early forties, I can't believe what, what this community of Asians went through. It's actually, this year is actually 50 years of mm -hmm. the expulsion of East Africans. And, you know, it actually made me think, oh my gosh, like, can you imagine picking up your entire life with young children mm. and starting all over again in a new country, a climate, which was freezing cold, right? Compared to Africa. And my parents started again. And um, it was one of the reasons my, my sister and I have a, a large age gap because my parents didn't want to bring kids into the world, yes. my brother and I, until they were financially stable and had settled. And, um, and of course, one of the first businesses my dad went into was... Um, store a store yeah. yeah so he he bought the first kind of piece of real estate which was mm -hmm. a building in a small town called london ontario which is about two hours from toronto and it has a quite a well-known university called western and richard ivy school and it was a small town and he bought this first piece of property and inside the property was a convenience store mm -hmm. like many asians and he built his business from there and then went on to kind of get into property and becoming an accountant and everything. But this was like his first investment he did. And having a convenience store, you can just imagine, had the best magazines in the world. Oh, there was right. W, mm -hmm. there was Town and Country, there was Vogue. I fell in love. I didn't care about storybooks. <laughs> I was just mesmerized by the photography and the fashion and the art. And having a sister that was 11 years older who was just gorgeous and she's tall and you know i'd go in her room and these magazines would be there and she had the prettiest you know lip glosses and high heels I mean, her name is jamila jamila no? yeah <laughs> exactly it's, my sister's name is jamila and i was very in awe of her like i just i mean still to this day and um so i'd always kind of sneak in her room and I'd go through the magazines and I would always kind of take the ones I loved from my dad's store. So my dad has this running joke with me saying, mm -hmm. you're always eating the profits because I'd always go in eating chocolates and taking magazines. But I think I was just very drawn to like this artistic fashion photography, like the beauty, the aesthetics. Um, and even when my parents were buying me dolls, I mean, I didn't care about the dress Barbie came in. I wanted to go to fabric land and buy mm -hmm. my own fabric and dress her up and you know, I asked for a sewing machine. I learned how to sew. Um, it was just, I think it really kind of translated at a very young age. And as I grew older, like fast forward in high school, we had a high school fashion show in the small towns where we were supporting like small boutiques. I was the first one to design my first collection. So they gave me a platform. And honestly, the girls I casted, you know, like quote unquote, were like the cheerleaders. They were just the gorgeous senior girls in high school wearing my clothes. and. It was just kind of a taste of the mm -hmm. fashion space. And then I did summer programs in Toronto for the summer in um, the Arts Academy. And fast forward, I just, I think I just fell in love with it. And I had the opportunity to apply for um, FIT in New York. And my sister and I went on this trip to London and we discovered University of Arts, which is London College of Fashion in Central St. Martins. And they had a very similar program called Fashion um, Business of Fashion. And I just, applied oh so it's called fashion management sorry it's BA fashion management and I applied and um you had to work at a museum out of uh, no we I applied I sent in my portfolio I was in it was a second uh year of graduates so they did the first trial of fashion management and the second group was 50 students 
and um, I applied. I went to the interview in London, and I showed them my portfolio, and and I'd studied so much. Like I, I just loved reading about like the industry, so I, I knew the business side of it. And so I had, did my interview, and I got accepted, and that was it. I packed my bags and moved to London. Amazing. And when did you have the opportunity to? Um, wh- when did you hear that Tom Ford have an interview and? You, so that you, was actually uh, really another crazy story. Yes. I, so every Sunday I would read the Sunday Times in the in the UK. And in the Sunday Times, there's a magazine called Style, which I would never miss. Mm-hmm. Like even if I had to run to every store, grocery store to get this newspaper, I would get it. And the editor at the time was Colin McDowell, who's a very famous fashion journalist. And so I was reading the magazine that day on a Sunday with my coffee and um, and one of the articles was about the Costume Society and the Costume Society in the UK is um, you know a group of you know older women who would just uh, like love uh, fashion and history and all of that so I called them there was a number at the bottom and they said oh next week's Costume Society or, or next week like a month later like the next Costume Society is an interview with Tom Ford at mm-hmm. the V&A so I called them and I said, listen, I'm a student. You don't understand. Like, I'm the biggest fan. I've written essays on him and like sure. literally just telling them everything I've done. And this woman was like, but you're, you don't even have a membership. Like, yeah. this is not for you. It's not for students. Yeah. It's for members only. And I, I think I just begged, begged on the her. phone. She goes, you have to make a donation. Hmm. I was like, what's the donation? <laughs> Whatever you want. Like, I just want to hear him speak. So she goes, it's 20 pounds. I was like, oh, okay, done? Fine. <laughs> yeah, done. <laughs> Paid the 20 pounds and I was so excited. So it was, I think, in a month's time. He was speaking at the VNA. And that day, I had an exam at school. So I'm looking at the clock, I'm writing this exam. And honestly, I don't know why Hikmet, it didn't think of me, like it didn't occur to me I should just take a black cab. But I think yeah. being a student, you, you took know, the, the you took, metro. I took the metro, I yes. took the subway, right? I took the tube. So I'm rushing to South Ken, running, running, running. I get out of South Ken Station, run to VNA. I mean, I'm super late, right? Like super late. I get to VNA, I'm like, where's the, where's the talk? And they're like, oh, it's in the atrium on the top floor. Hikmet. I'm like, <laughs> are you kidding me? There's no elevators, right? So I'm like running up the stairs, panting, like super late. The door opens and this woman just grabs me because it's silent. Everyone's, yeah, you know, so. watching the auditorium with, the, with Colin McDowell interviewing Tom Ford. And this woman just grabs me and I sit down. So I, I watched the rest of the interview, super inspired, completely in awe of Mr. Ford. And uh, the lights go on and this woman turns around and I'm literally the youngest person in this room, mm-hmm. right? Like it's all these kind of older, older people. And so this woman goes, why are you here? Like, who are you? And I said, so I tell her this story. I was like, you don't understand. Like I've written essays on him and I, like about Gucci group and acquisitions. And I, this is like, I'm just in awe of him. And I just wanted to hear him speak. And uh, so she was like, oh my God, I've never met anyone who was like so passionate yes, and well, yes. you know, well read about Mr. Ford and Gucci group. And I just knew everything. And so I said, listen, I'd love to like, how do I, like, I'd love to work with you. Like, mm. tell me. And she goes, you know what? Come in for an interview. Here's my card. Send me your resume. Wow. wow. As soon as I got home, wrote up my resume, emailed her. She emailed me back. She's like 3 p.m. Come the next day. Gave you an, gave you an interview. Gave me an interview. Before we, before we go, yeah. I just want to go back a little bit yeah, yeah. to the, the moment you were running late. Because yeah. I pictured that moment because it happens when somebody's passionate, when somebody yeah. is like viewing that that's my future, yeah. that's something I'm so passionate. I just want to know your feeling at that minute, moment because it's something that's just like we always um, have to run after our goals. Yeah. We always have to, you know, put the effort. You you made, you you, you begged the girl, the lady to, to, to give you an opportunity to, to be in this uh, interview with Tom Ford. I mean, you've done so much to maybe get a chance yeah an uh, opportunity which is something I really I want to know what you were feeling uh, you were a young uh, girl you were afraid to miss that moment yeah you know I think when you I think you have to try right like uh, as long as I tried and I try I, I literally had an exam that day I was a student I didn't have a crazy budget so thinking of taking a black cab wouldn't even cross my mind to spend 20 or 30 pounds or whatever it is I was like okay whatever the fastest way is it's a tube as long as you try, if the doors closed that day, I would have been like, you know what? I tried. I did my best. I did my best, mm. right? I did everything in my capacity to get there on time. If the doors were closed, but the doors opened for mm. me that day. 
the doors open and I remember Kat Jamison and I Crap still buy the shirts. Yeah. And I done. still <laughs> am friends with this woman. She is just amazing. And she gave me that chance. She but she, because I'm sure she saw the passion in your eyes. She saw how much yeah. you're running. She saw how much you are looking for that. You know, opportunity. I, was, I went in, I was, I could answer anything she asked me mm. that day. Right. I felt like I was really prepared. And when you're prepared and you have that opportunity, I think that's when like luck and all that stuff come together. So yeah, it happened. I sent in my resume at three o'clock. I had an interview and I started interning while I was in college and it was picking up the phones. It was, it was doing all that work, like getting the coffees, picking up the phones, packing up samples, but to be in that environment as an intern, just learning that was the best, mm -hmm. right? It's like, that is the best. And so all these opportunities started, started to start aligning. And, and so fast forward when Mr. Ford was like looking at, you know, this girl, Rosemond, like I keep hearing about Rosemond, like she works really hard. She's there at like 5 a.m. doing the fax, you know, fax machine. That's how old mm -hmm. I am, by the way. Yeah. But like when there's a fax machine or like review time, like I was there, I was present, I was prepared. I wasn't looking at the time going, oh, it's nine o'clock or six o'clock or whatever. I was doing the work. And so when that opportunity came for an interview and he was building his personal team and literally his office is here, his PA is here and I'm right next to him. And when that opportunity came, I was in second year university and I couldn't take the job because my parents are like, nope, your, you your degree, you have to finish your school. And my dad go, and I remember the dean of the school, I told him, I said, I got an acceptance letter to oh work for God. Mr. Ford's office. Yeah, exactly. And the dean said, Rosemond, you're well, like, what an amazing opportunity. Yeah. We're so proud of you. You're coming out of our school to work yeah. with Mr. Ford and Gucci group. And they said, we'll keep a spot for you. You know, if you ever come back and honestly, I know myself, I wouldn't have never, I would have, and my parents knew as well. They're like, you are definitely not going back. Oh my, my dad God. goes, you're, yeah. you, I sent you to the UK to get an education and that diploma and that, you know, you're going to take it and come back. And if he wants you, that job will be there. And I'm not kidding you, Hikmet. That's what happened. I handed in my dissertation a year later on a, I think it was like a, on a Thursday, Thursday night. And I was working with him Monday morning. Cause you told him, I, I still have one more year I to said, finish. I said, yeah, I have one and more year said, to finish. he said, call me after, yeah. after a year. He I says, mean, you have my number. This is like, yeah. And the, and mo the moment you had the graduation. I no, I literally handed, not even the graduation. I handed him my dissertation on a Thursday mm -hmm. and it was like, this is it. And ironically, my, my dissertation was on mergers and acquisitions, um, organic growth versus like, uh, like acquired brands. And, um, and I told him what it was about because, you know, there's a huge case study on, on Gucci group and LVMH and, and Thursday, yeah, Monday morning, I had a job in his office and, but it's not about like, it's just all these things start aligning, right? It's because he knew I was working hard. He knew I was putting but that were, time were, were in. Were you worried you could have missed the opportunity? Yeah, I was really worried. And I begged my parents and my dad goes, nope, <laughs> you are getting that piece of paper. The traditional parents yeah. finished studying. Finished and, studying. Then... and I'm so glad I did. Right. Because imagine now I would feel, I don't know. I think I'd feel quite disappointed in myself if I didn't do it for them. You mm. know? And my parents, honestly, they work so hard to, I think about how much my mom was working to make sure that she, you know, the rent was being paid and my tuition was getting paid. And you can imagine the Canadian dollar and was times three for, yeah, versus for the pound the UK. Yes, of course. Back then. And so they worked really hard and I was actually so embarrassed to tell them how expensive London was because you forget about everything in between, right? Mm. Like the travel, the, the, like just little things. So I was doing a part-time job. I worked at an art gallery for a while at Blaine's Fine Art. I worked at Burberry in the showroom. I worked at, where else did I work? Burberry. I worked at Sotheby's. Mm. I worked at the, ex, helping at the exhibitions at Sotheby's. I worked at Prada on Sloan Street for a few months, I think six months there on Saturdays. Like I knew I wanted to be there and whatever time I had, even if it was that extra pocket, like whatever money I was making was like my pocket money, you know, but I'm so glad I did everything. Mm -hmm. And how long did you stay with Tom Ford? And what's the experience so was, you had? I was with him for five. I was with Gucci Group for five years. I was with, yeah, I was with Tom. And uh, so I think four years with Tom and one year in Milan. And I joined the design team there. But working with him, honestly, like, and I say this to this day, and he knows I say this all the time, is I learned more from him than I did in university. Mm. Because to work with your mentor and to watch him, uh, you know, people management, like, 
just everything, design collections, his vision, his styling, his business, the way he, everything from PR and marketing. I mean, the guy was just a genius. And so to just be with him all the time and to learn from him, so grateful. You had this instinct to uh, to know about the collection, which one is editorial, which one is commercial. Yeah. <laughs> but I think that's a trained, it's a trained eye. And mm. I, I under started understanding from him. So when he would look at, you know, people think that a collection is just what you see on the runway. It's yeah. not, right? Like the what you see on the runway is the point of view of the designer. Mm. So that's his vision. Those 40 looks are his vision. But when you actually go in the store, you see that there's pants and there's trousers yes. and accessories. And like there's a huge, huge collection mm. around it, right? Um, and so I started to train my eye because I was watching him and he could look at a spreadsheet and be like, okay, this works, this doesn't, let's change the colors. And, and it, that comes with experience. Mm. And for me, it did, to be honest, like I learned from him. Um, and for the, all the jobs I started getting afterwards, all these, um, skill set, like these skill sets all applied and, and came to fruition and I still use them. How do you see this new collection or new trends that's happening, like maybe Balenciaga, maybe that these crazy ideas that we see in, in the runway and it's just like, is someone going to wear this? Is someone going to, are they, are they, you think, is this purely editorial? Is this purely something that just inspirational or, or, or the trend can go anywhere and we can wear these things that are not practical, crazy, beautiful, artistic, yeah. but. I think fashion is art and it's a way that everyone expresses themselves. Um, so yeah, I think, I think there's a little bit of something for everyone. And that's what I believe. I believe you'll always, and I think if you can't find something, then you should create it, right? You have the opportunity to. So yeah, I think, I think fashion is just a great way to express yourself. And, uh, but, but I see you're like kind of Chanel girl. <laughs> <laughs> Very, I'm class. You're a classic and this and where do you think it's how, how much is uh, the when you talk about the way I describe my style oh. is um, I'm feminine classic with a twist of trend so I still like trend I still but I know what suits me what I feel comfortable in I know what suits my body shape so I, I kind of dip into to trends but I always kind of make it in a way that works for me yes Okay, now you had the opportunity also. When did you go to Dubai? You had a, you had a boyfriend that <laughs> <laughs> plays polo? Tell me about that. I had a partner that played, yeah. That was a very expensive mistake, by the way. Um, yeah, let's just say I'm not very good in the love life. Um, yeah, I mean, I'd been traveling to Dubai for about 20 something years. Um, so not only for business, but I, I loved I loved Dubai. It was Dubai. great. You used to come for a weekend. I'd come for weekends because living in London, it was gray and it was mm. raining and Emirates, I love Emirates. If they're listening to this podcast, we love you. Um, Emirates had this amazing flight in London and it would leave at 10 p.m. and it would land, I think, at 6 a.m. in Dubai. So you could actually have a full day of work on a Friday, right? Pack okay. up your stuff, get to the airport by eight and get on this flight. So it was actually like, you know, two, it's three days in the season. sun, the beach, you'd feel recharged. Um, and so I would do these weekends here when I just needed to get out of the gray and the rain and so I'd come to Dubai. So I started knowing the lay of the land and mm. I had a few friends here. You know, the more you travel, you start kind of um, having friends. And also because I was working at Gucci and I, I worked at Juicy Couture, we were opening offices and stuff here, like stores. So I started coming here and started seeing how, you know, the city was getting built and the construction mm -hmm. and the excitement. Um, but yeah, I mean, I moved here 15 years ago. It was supposed to be for three weeks and three weeks ended up being 15 years later. Yeah, I want to know the, the uh, incident when you when you worked with Tiffany <laughs> and we had this opportunity and they asked you as, uh, OK, what's the name of your company? Yeah. <laughs> and you created, you didn't have a company. I didn't that. have a company. Um, yeah, so when we decided to, you know, set up a life here, initially it was supposed to be like splitting up London and Dubai, like 50-50. I think people always say that. They want to have this kind of split their time. And the more time I was here, because we were building a house, I was sitting in the hotel and I would start going out to, you know, Emirates Towers mm -hmm. and just kind of exploring the retail scene. And a lot of my ex-colleagues were like, oh, Rosman, you're in Dubai. Would you mind doing me a favor? And I was like, sure. Mm -hmm. They're like, can you just tell me, you know, we back then, like 15 years ago, it was a very franchised model. So they weren't hands-on with the brand. So mm. now there's joint ventures, but it, before it was just franchised, right? Like when you went into an emerging market. So they're like, can you just go in and just 
give us your feedback on what the buy looks like. What is the customer service like? Do they know the design or do they know how to describe the fabrics? And so I literally just started doing that. And I did it for one brand who was like one of my friends who was an executive at a, at a shoe brand. And then it was a clothing brand and my name started getting passed around. They're like, mm -hmm. oh, Roseman's there. She'll just, yeah. just ask her just like, <laughs> you know, she, she knows. And, and again, right. It goes back to having that trained eye because I had a trained eye. Mm -hmm. I would go into the retail store and I'm like, you know what? You're missing this entire category. Like, you know, the women in, in the Middle East, they're starting to work like, you know, they're starting to work and they need shoes you can walk in. They don't need so much crystals. Like mm. they need a little bit of evening wear. They need a little bit of classic heels, flats. And so I started giving them feedback going, you know, it needs to be more similar to the buy in London or it needs to be similar mm -hmm. to this. And these are the classic styles you're missing. So I started giving feedback and my name got passed around, passed around, passed around and uh, did it for great brands. And then finally I get this call from from Tiffany's in New York and um, they were working with Damas and so um, I worked closely with the team from Damas here and they were like listen we are opening in the world's largest mall yes. do you know what that is and I was like of course <laughs> it's, you know Dubai mall which was a construction site back then they're like you don't understand we're the first opening of of Dubai mall so it needs store. it's going to be the biggest mall in the world it's our flagship it is right at the main entrance it's the first big opening and you know, come up with a concept for it. And we want you to do the, you know, PR. We want you to do the event. The CEO is coming. The famous yellow diamonds coming. The gemologist. And so we came up with this beautiful concept, like a blue carpet. We did the first breakfast at Tiffany's. We did, um, a, you know, a beautiful dinner with like the CEO, and I think it was like the American ambassador, or someone, you know, in in that side. And then we did like. You know, a ge you know, the gemologist mm -hmm. was here with the yellow diamond. We did, what else did we do? We did, what, what I loved about it the most actually was I had this amazing creative director who was working with me. Her name was Yasi. And she came up with this concept where the outside was of New York. Mm -hmm. And then you enter the blue carpet and you see the New York skyline. And then you're entering the Dubai store. So it was like New York to Dubai. And so we created this incredible concept. And, um, people just started talking because every element was touched, right? It was mm. like connecting New York to Dubai. It was explaining the heritage of the beautiful blue box, the love story. It was a charity night. We did a jazz charity night with proceeds going to Dubai Cares that night. Like every element was touched of what the importance of this beautiful brand Tiffany's was. And it just got a lot of, it got a lot of buzz. And I think the other, the other thing that gave us a lot of attention was everyone was so used to these huge events and I came from the school of Tom Ford, right? Mm, like mm. everything is about niche and small and experiences. So rather than doing a, an event for 500 people, I did breakfast at Tiffany's for 35 women. And I remember people were calling me going, how come I'm not on the invite list? Yeah. But it was really about women who just were passionate about high mm. jewelry and, and women that wanted to learn more about the brand. And so we started doing these really niche events. And I think that kind of got us a lot of attention. And we were also the first multi-brand showroom. So we were carrying samples um, from beautiful brands like Christian Louboutin and Cara Ross. And we were working really closely with Damas at the time that had um, Paspali and Graf. Mm -hmm. And Graf, yes. Yeah. And from from that moment, you opened your company. Uh... Yeah, so it was a really funny. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, sorry, I kind of jumped at it. But yeah, so basically I get this call and he's telling me about what he wants, you know, because yes. he was so nervous. The CEO is coming after, I think, 12, 14 years to, to the Middle East. He goes, Rosemont, it has to be perfect. Yeah. So I was like, yes. of course. And I said, let me put up a concept. And 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 towards the end of the call, he's like, oh, yeah, by the way, like, what, what's, the, like, what's the name of your company? And I literally paused because he's like, he goes, this is our budget. Yes. You know, and I was like, oh, my God, like everything that I've been doing for free, like the yeah. free advice and the free, you know, like, you know, giving advice back to as all these brands. Individual. As an individual. Yes. for Because they were my ex-colleagues. Mm. I was doing all this stuff for free. And he comes back to me. He's like, oh, yeah, this is our budget. And what's the name of your company again? So I can drop the contract. And I was like, what? <laughs> and I just remember like pulling out my last, you know, my last name's hyphenated. I said, it's uh, uh, RR and Co, like Roseman Retention <laughs> Company, bespoke luxury management. And I put the phone down. I remember calling the lawyer like literally ASAP. And I was like, you need to register this company ASAP. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of we how it started. That's, that's amazing. That's amazing story. But I, I will tell you, and you know, like I speak a lot at, at universe whatever universities and these um 
you know, small business owners. And Mm. my best advice that moment I will always remember is once I decided to open that business, I sat on the dining room table, I took a notepad and I started doing a SWOT analysis of myself. So I said, oh my God, I'm starting this company. What does this company look like? So what what services do I want to give the brand? Because by this time I'd already kind of been in Dubai for like, I guess like two months or whatever it was, three months. And I started seeing what the gaps in the market are. So I was like, these are the gaps in the market that I see. This is my skill set from Europe and my past experiences. But what are my personal strengths? So I started writing down my strengths. And I was like, okay, like this is this is coming together. This is what mm-hmm. the company looks like. This is what the services are. These are the gaps that I see, right? So my brain my brain's starting to go as an entrepreneur, right? Like how are you gonna fix this problem? Like, um, so uh, the hardest thing to do is actually write your weaknesses. Mm. So I started writing going, oh my God, like I don't have a finance background. I, I don't know how to set up a business. Um, you know, I needed a writer. I needed someone to, to manage the showroom. So I started writing, I needed an IT person. So I started writing all my weaknesses and operational um, things that I would need to build this business. And once I started seeing my role very clearly, the mission of the company, right? So what is the mission of the company? My role as like the head and the founder and how, how do I make that vision and that mission come alive? So I need to start filling these gaps. And that's how I started hiring literally what I think, what I believe were like the best people right, I worked with. The right team for the you. The right team. Mm. Because you need a great team to support you and execute your vision as a founder and a CEO of a business. So, I mean, to me, that's like the best lesson that I can always tell people. And, and if you ask me my failure, my failure was that I didn't invest in a proper finance person to really Hmm. put me in check because as the business was growing rapidly like it just mushroomed I was pulling out of my own pocket right I was like okay I just need to get this done or I need to like get this printed it could be something so small or something as big as getting office furniture and so it's really important to have a finance person to always put you in check it's the best investment and to make sure you have a team that is so clearly defined that they are your support system to execute your vision and that you trust Mm -hmm. Well, definitely, Rosman. But the thing is like, okay, once you have this company, maybe you need to know and to put this structure for the company. Mm-hmm. But what I'm inspired by your story is, is, the, is the passion for the hard work, is the passion for the love of, of reaching to, to your goals. And um, you did it all the way with uh, the, the girl that's running out after her love, her, fa- her passion for, for, for fashion, for, the, for this industry. And you have actually done some work without having a company at the beginning. You, you didn't even think that you need a company. So it's you, you put on the hard work before you just started a company. And this is something we need to learn. You, you need you, something that it's maybe for the new comer, for the new people who are trying to see, OK, how can I do it? How can I open a company? It's not it's not the structure of the company. Maybe the structure can be done by reading a book and we can know how is the structure of the company but you need to know what what do you love as you mentioned like this is my weaknesses this is what i love yeah, this is so and 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 the hard work and reaching out for opportunity and reaching out for people uh, asking people for help and asking people for advice and keep on persistent on, on all the goals that you want to achieve mm-hmm. in life and you you find that that what you have done is really inspiring uh, before you. before building the company it didn't come just like that you yeah. know it came from from well you have to understand like you know being here because we were like building this house and I was sitting here like in a hotel I was like let me go out let me start understanding and so the more time I was spending here it allows you to really do a recce like understand what the market is like um, and how you can build it and so you know today I'm so proud that I can walk into Fashion Avenue or Fashion Dome and to know that I was a part of the growth of these amazing brands, whether it was their store openings or consumer events, it, it makes like, honestly, I get so proud to see a mall of Emirates because mm. I saw it from nothing. Like I saw an empty piece of land to just be built to like, honestly, it's my favorite mall. Right. And so same with Dubai Mall. I get excited when I'm traveling around the world and people speak so highly of this city because I feel like it, maybe like a tiny percentage of me yes. helped contribute to the mm. fashion industry here and so it makes me so proud to be here and in uh, honestly i'm so grateful for the city to give a support system to support small businesses and um, definitely Ros- rosman how do you see the the, the crowd 
uh, of of fashion that's that's happening around it's the the um the different you know we, we've been exposed a lot with a lot of images how much is the consumer is getting satisfied from the creativity that's happening are the brands having a struggle of being creative or trying to sell uh, brands like it's uh, it's really crowded how the taste how, how you can reach to the taste of the consumer of mm, what because they've seen a lot they've seen so many images mm -hmm. they've seen instagram has you know like uh, millions of photos every day we can watch and see many many uh, different designs and different look is is this uh, a challenge for many brands uh, right now i mean all i can tell you and i think there's facts out there is that you know I, we are visual people now right like everything is visual whether it's boards instagram um tiktok i mean whatever these platforms are so whatever you put out there has to be a strong image it needs to be able you need to be able to communicate to your client you need to be able to have ease and you know i always tell businesses it's worth if you are going on the e-commerce route set up a meeting with the team from instagram or facebook and work together of how you can be profitable with your business how to do like the shop links and everything is learning so it's not and that's what I was saying in the beginning is like every this is all new for everyone right like I'm still learning about the metaverse mm. like every day I'm trying to read something and it's still <laughs> over my head and an NFT is still over my head but every day I'm learning a little bit more um, and that's probably why I don't really talk about NFTs or metaverse or any mm. of this stuff because I don't understand it myself so I'm not going to I'm not going to promote something or share something with my followers that I don't understand so for me it's really about uh, understanding what it's about right and um and then promoting it and for brands it, it's just it's a really congested space yes and um and so i think you have to have a clear vision and i think in this market you really have to be able to adapt you know you need to be able mm -hmm. to pivot and adapt and i think covid was a really um, important time where brands really just needed to be on it Yes, and they, uh, they, uh, they adapted. You can see it also from, yeah, especially most, Tom Ford and... Uh, so many brands went digital. Uh, I yes. mean, everyone from a Dior to like uh, Joe Malone, like you can just in one click order the item to your home. Mm. Um, so I think a lot of the brands like COVID really pushed, accelerated the digital digital age. Digital, sure. but and how do you see them well? Also the kind of like um, um, alter or, or create... Um, uh, fashion that's related to the re uh, region and you, know, you find that these brands Dolce & Gabbana and Tom Ford that they have created these tastes that matches the also the the Arab words the the region uh, more. So I, I think one of the best um, one of the best things now is that there's so many like exclusives for this region which are amazing mm. um, so brands are really understanding the market here I think a lot of that has to do with them having offices here now so when I had RR and Co, it was we were kind of the bridge between because there was no they didn't have head offices when when we had the company the consultancy firm. So we were kind of the bridge between the franchise partner and the head office, and we would tell them we're like, okay, even someone like an Alice Temperley, I was like, let's try and let's try and a Temperley London Abaya, and mm. you know she was willing to try these designs, and so we were the kind of the the little middle link between the franchise and the head office. Um, and now a lot of these big brands have have representation in the region. Mm. And the Middle East is a very important market, and to, you know some of the most stylish women are here. Yes, but do you see it? For, it's it's only from a com commercial perspective, or it's it's also a cultural, it's a diversity kind of a change, where you find all these brands they are going that route. They are taking this uh, diverse, uh, having uh, addressing different women. And not having the, this typical kind of fashion line and fashion icon shape of a woman. And now they are more open to different culture and they have to address it in their own language or it's pure commercial. No, I think, I mean, honestly, I always give the example of Dolce Gabbana. I mean, they do such a wide range. And I think when a woman loves, like, I love a good Dolce print, right? Mm. But I can go in and find a long like a long kaftan in that print i can find it in a short dress in that print so i think they're one of the f great brands a great example of a brand that have been able to take their iconic design and make it for every woman around the world i think they've done it very well because they started from the roots of of their uh, the street of italy and th that's the root so it's kind of talks to 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 kind of like we have similarities here and there and we can find ourselves in this brand as well yeah and i just i mean it's it is one of my favorite 
favorite brands. And I just love that any woman can wear that print of the season. You know, if she loves fashion and she mm. wants to wear it and she wants to be a little bit more modest or she wants to be in a caftan, it's available. That that silhouette's avail available. Or if she wants to wear like in a trouser pantsuit, it's available. So I think they do a really big, diverse range. How do you see the designers coming from Dubai, from the region? And it's like, the, how uh, how much chance do they have to, to go international? And, and maybe you've met, have you been in the Arab... Uh, Fashion Week and maybe your I opinion mean, on that. What's what a great example of the giving movement. I'm so proud of that brand. I mean, they genuinely have given back um, and even the amount of money they've raised to Harmony House. Like I can see it. My my friend owns that and I can see the impact that it's changed lives. So when you're shopping, it's actually guilt free shopping. Mm. And so now with giving movement, I literally when I'm buying gifts for friends, I'm buying from giving movement and I'm so proud. It's a it's a UAE based brand. Um, I think that's made global impact. I mean, I was in London and I was seeing people with the giving movement walking around. I thought that was quite cool. What else? Oh, I love Bamba, mm -hmm. Maha, Rashid. I love her. I wear her stuff all the time, like from her first collection of her lace dresses to I just got a linen short set recently. I'm so proud to wear these brands. I get excited to wear them when I'm traveling and um and, you know, when people compliment me, I get very proud to say, you know, I'm wearing Bamba or the giving movement. So I think there's great brands coming yeah. out of the region. That's Rami amazing. Ali. I love Rami Ali. Rami Ali is always good. I wear it's him on stage a lot. Um, and he's been such a great partner for me. Like when I'm doing award ceremonies or galas, like I get so proud to wear him. So, yeah, I, I think there's great talent coming out of here. He's an amazing person. Maybe I should uh, interview yes, Rami. Yes, you should. My friend. We love Rami. <laughs> of course. All right. So, Roseman, mm -hmm. what you've been up to now? What's uh, what's your future plans? How's your company doing? So I had this amazing experience, by the way, when I turned 40, which was during COVID. So which is kind of good. So no one really celebrated because I didn't I mean, want to tell look, you people. Look 30, I don't think this Hikmet, this is why we're friends. You're so <laughs> nice. Um, so, yeah, I turned 40 in 2020 and I got this amazing call from the UK Parliament to speak at uh, Women's Day in the House of Lords and in, in the Parliament. And I don't know if you've ever seen these speeches, but you're only allowed five minutes exactly. Like they literally cut your mic off. So they wanted to talk about having, having this business in an emerging market and making that leap from London to Dubai. And my history, like my history of these 40 years. And so I, my brother is in media, so I, I give Hussein credit, but he, he pretty much wrote my, my speech. It was exactly four minutes and 56 seconds. And, um, you, ha and he's a script writer, which I'm going to give a shout out to. This is why he's very good at that. But, uh, so he, he helped me write the script and I, we were talking about stories of growing up and, you know, it's the reason I can sit across from you and talk about my parents being immigrants. And, you know, where does that work ethic come from? It comes from my parents. Mm -hmm. And so when I wrote the speech with my brother and I spoke at Parliament, it was so funny. It was the one thing that my dad is was so proud of. It didn't matter if I was in L.A. at an award show or a fashion week or any celebrity I've ever met. Like, my dad didn't care. But to be at Parliament and speak, my dad was just over the moon. And it was literally, I can say, one of the proudest moments I've ever had. I've never practiced for anything as much as I have for that. But I, I did this speech on, at Parliament and it was really talking about reflecting my life because I think sometimes we're always on the go, right? Like you, you do an achievement, you close a deal, you, you celebrate for two minutes and then you're literally working for, the, you're just hustling all the time, mm -hmm. working, building, growing, you know. And at that point, it was like, literally I had to stop and be like, oh my God, what have I done in 40 years? Like I have moved from Canada to the UK, to Italy, then back to London, and then Dubai, and and traveled the world. And I just sat there going, wow, like I've done a lot in 40 years. And it's, and it's allowed me to look at my strengths, so being able to adapt and pivot, to look at opportunities, to say yes to opportunities, to trust my gut, um, to listen to your inner voice. And I now, you know, had this great PR company then decided to close it from there i still have uh the consultancy side so we do now we do a lot of like consumer experiences um but very niche so we still work with these beautiful big gorgeous brands but we do um small consumer experiences and then i set up this small media company and you know i get to 
be on stage. And, you know, last just last night I was emceeing the masterclass for Makeup by Mario, which was mm -hmm. amazing. And I got to interview him and, you know, I was sharing with the audience how hard he was working. He started as like a sales assistant at Sephora. And from there he built his business and, you know, became one of the most famous makeup artists in the world. And I love sharing stories. And I have a small little talk show that I do in partnership with Indigo Living, which is featuring women um, who've set up businesses, small and big. And that's what's exciting me now is storytelling. It's you know, taking my experience and being around people that I get to share their stories and learn from them and talk about the highs and lows. And that's what's exciting me right now. Yes, I mean, I mean that's uh, that's amazing. That's why, honestly, I I, I started my podcast. It's just I want to hear the story of people, and which most of them they, they have the similar kind of story, which is a personal. And um, because w once we start working, once we start, you know, have a dream, and we think it's to to achieve there, it's just uh, it's just uh, something impossible. Or that person is very famous. And how to achieve this uh, when you listen to his story and it's all gen whenever it's genuine whenever it's hard work whenever it comes from a, from a different culture from a uh, be yourself kind of uh, you know uh, experience be yourself kind of do what you love it's always when you reflect that then like now we know Rosman, we know where she came from we know where the love of fashion came from it's just from this ordinary that anybody can do, but if they put the hard work, if they the be themselves, hundred percent. And and listening to these stories is very uh, inspirational and um, amazing, and I'm inspired. No, thank and, you. And uh, and really, uh, it's great having you. Uh, Hikmet, you know, wanna, no, thank you so much. And I wanted to say, you know, I'm so grateful one to the UAE, right, for just giving me an opportunity to grow and adapt and try. But when you have a platform and people start recognizing you, I think it's really important to, to look back and be like, always go back to your value system. You know, what do you want to speak about? What, what's the truth that you want to speak about? And so for me, um, I know we're, we're speaking before we're recording, but like one of the two things that are super important to me is breast cancer awareness. You know, my mom had it before the age of 40 and I was three years old. And it was at a time when there was no, people didn't know what it was. They, they were afraid of that word. And I, I saw what she went through. And so now for me, like I use my platform to, you know, literally support whether it's Pink Caravan or Pink Pony Ralph Lauren or anyone that is just willing to talk about it and um, and just share that story and share with women to, to take that mammogram, to do that ultrasound and to talk about it and be free about it. And so I try and use my platform to do good in the areas that I am, you know, I feel strongly about. And so I, I hope whoever follows me out there, you know, is is inspired and, you know, and follows the things that I'm passionate about. So, you know, whether it's a little bit of art and fashion and beauty or women's empowerment and, and supporting women in small business, like those are the things I want to talk about right now. Love of giving, love of sharing. Love of giving and giving back. And so, yeah. And so, yeah, I think whoever's following me, I want to say thank you. And also, um, yeah, I hope you get inspired and, and I hope you're enjoying the journey with me. That's amazing. Um, did you watch Dr. Huria? Uh, I love her. It's, it's, she's amazing. I did a uh, podcast with her. She's a stunning woman. So if, with her every year, I literally keep the month of October free. So anything that her and I can do together, um, she's... We met at the ST Lauder uh, yeah, event. event yes. yes. No, she's amazing and, and such a great advocate. And so she, I'm sure she told you incredible stories, yes, right? About yes. how like... You can even talk, say the word breast, right? Mm, you can mm. even say the word cancer. And now it's so amazing. Like women are talking about it. They are, you know, in the month of, even last night I was on stage and I wore a pink suit. Like I wanted people to know that this month, wear it, talk about it, you know, make that appointment. And honestly, I don't know when this podcast is going out, but there's so many clinics out there that have like given free mammograms, um, and you know, or reduce or discounted the price and please go out there. So all the ladies listening. <laughs> That's a great message and uh, that's a great ending. Thank you so much. Thanks, uh, Hikmet, for having me. It was lovely talking to you. Thank you. Thank you, Habibi. <laughs>